Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Jesse Frizzell. Uh, thanks for having me here, by the way. I always love coming to Chicago because my sister lives here, and Chicago is nice in the summer. Um, other than yesterday when it rained, I also feel like that was my fault for being here. So, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be talking about why open source firmware is important, and I actually hate giving the same talk twice, so this one's going to be a little bit different and also go into, like, roots of trust and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so, if you think about, like, the layers of software today, um, it's kind of like you have a bunch of software on top, uh, like your app, and then maybe something that controls the app. Um, and then you have your operating system kernel, uh, and then you have firmware, and then you have the hardware. So it's like all software and then hardware, um, just to make it super, super general. And then if we make it even more general, it's like everything is shit. Um, and I think everyone can agree on that, uh, because everything has bugs and everything is horrible. So if we look at like the privilege levels for this kind of stack. Um, you have like ring three, which is user space. Ring two like doesn't really exist anymore. It was like drivers, uh, same with ring one. Um, ring zero is your kernel space. And then uh, ring negative one, also like kind of the negative rings um, are, are made up. But if you really think about it, like all the rings are made up. Um, so. There's ring negative one, which is like your hypervisor, like Zen or uh, KVM or whatever you choose to use, Beehive. Uh, and then there's ring negative two, which is like system management mode and the UEFI kernel, uh, which we'll get into the details of. And then there's ring negative three at the very bottom, which is like the, in, the management engine if you're on like x86. Um, and then there's equivalents on other processors. So the code that we like don't know about, because you can use open source software for all the others, um, is like system management mode, UEFI kernel, um, and the management engine. Um, and so that's, that, that's like pretty scary, um, that like our most privileged software is in the layers that we don't know about. So let's like kind of go over what these are. So system management mode was originally for power management, then people shoved a bunch of other shit in there. So then it's like hard, uh, hardware control, proprietary design code. So like vendors will add a lot of new features there and be like, just throw it into system management mode. It's like maybe it would be better somewhere else. Um, it handles like system events, like memory or chipset errors. There's like runtime uh, kind of things there as well. So like correctable errors, stuff like that. Um, and it's like a half kernel. Uh, then we have the UEFI kernel which is like extremely complex. I don't know if anyone's looked at the code for the UEFI kernel, but if you ask people that like work on it, they're like, it takes forever to fix a bug because it's like ungreppable. Um, it's unreadable code. It's just like way too much code. Um, so someone was telling me that they like tried to make like a one line change to the UEFI kernel and it took forever to even find like where the bug was or anything like that, um, which is horrifying. Um, so UEFI applications are active after boot. Um, and then there's like security from obscurity here because like no one can really wrap their head around it unless you like hire the author of UEFI, which is like the one kind of like reaction that people have when you're like UEFI is really bad and they're like, oh no, but like we hired the author. And it's like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> you got like the one person who knows that. Um, so then there's like a bajillion other features in there and you can look them up if you really want to, but like no one can wrap their head around it, so like honestly it's not worth it. Um, so then there's Intel Management Engine, and so this has networking management, KVM management, um, Intel proprietary features, there's like of course you can look up all of these like crazy things that the management engine does as well, um, and then there's, it can actually like re-image your device even if it's powered off, which is incredibly terrifying. Also terrifying that there's like a, a, a web server in there. Um, so it's like, it can re-image your device and it's also hooked up to the internet, like great. Um, so it can turn on, on the node invisibly. Uh, and then it runs Minix, which like no one knew for the longest time. So the, the most popular Unix runtime is Minix, um, which is crazy. So, um, there ended up being, like, in 2017, uh, this critical bug in all of Intel processors that happened 
because of this Minix layer, and that's like when it came out that in, uh, that they were using Minix, is that like there was a bug in the the network server, the web server in Minix in the Intel management engine. It's just like why is that even there? Um, is a really good question, uh, and why is it still there is an even better question. So. That's just one example of a bad attack, but like if you Google like any sort of firmware bugs or anything, um, you can easily find others. Um, one that was kind of recent was the uh, Bloomberg's article on like mod chips on uh, super micro boards. And like while this probably didn't happen, it was still entirely possible and you can find uh, a great talk on it from Trammell Hudson at uh, I think it was like 33C3, uh, but it's called Mod Chips of the State, and it, it's like amazing because he actually goes through exactly how you would do this, and it, it's like incredibly complex, of course, and you have to like hack the supply chain, but it's like why would you hack the supply chain if you could just like walk right through the firmware, right? It seems a lot easier. So this is bad, like, I mean, one, you could actually do Mod Chips, but like, two, the firmware is already very easy to get through, so just use that. Um, but it gets even worse. So there's a feature called Intel Boot Guard, and what this allows uh, you to do is kind of like guard the firmware on your box, which sounds great, right, like in theory. Um, so with Boot Guard, like, you are kind of locked into always booting the same firmware, and you get to sign it, and Intel verifies that, like, this firmware has been signed. Um, but you can't actually then modify the firmware, say like I want to run like core boot or something instead. Um, you can't because like Intel owns the keys and you can't sign it, but what you actually can do, and this is what like Trammell figured out and this is in a different talk of his, so um, you can, there was a bug where like basically if you get rid of the screen that says like you can't boot this firmware uh, and you don't replace it, it will be like oh I can't find the image and then it will boot anyways. So it's like this isn't even doing its job at the end of the day, and also it's making it really hard for people to actually run like open source firmware, which I'll get into like what those options are and stuff like that. Um, but it's, it, it also is like kind of causing Intel to just own the software process that you're running on your computers and on their chips. So if we add up all the things that are like in these lower stacks, you get two and a half other kernels. So like already you're probably running like Linux um, or Windows or Solaris or whatever, your own OS and own kernel, uh, but then you also have these two and a half other ones that like no one has really vetted um, and no one really knows what's going on in, and then each of them have their own networking stacks and web servers, which makes no fucking sense. Um, and then the code can modify itself and persist. So like you're connected to the internet and the code can modify itself. And we have no idea what the code even looks like because we can't see it, right? Um, so that's horrifying. Um, all of them have exploits. They're all incredibly complex. So my hypothesis is like, once you need to deal with the firmware, it becomes a pain. And this comes from like uh, a survey that I sent out online and then also like talking to people. Um, but I kind of love like, I, I asked this on the internet and like there was a bunch of replies, but I'll go over like some really funny ones. Um, but basically, like, the pain is astronomical just at the firmware level, and, I mean, just in general, like, computers are shit, and I'll kind of go over that as well just because it's funny. Um, so, uh, super micro BIOS and IPMI bug where trying to load the IPMI module would freeze up your SSA se session and the machine would drop traffic, but updating the firmware would 50-50 break the server. And this is like actually super common. Like in talking to people, like bricking your server with firmware, super common. So even in this second one, like there was this one time when we almost bricked 1,000 machines with bad BIOS. Also this time we actually bricked 3,000 machines at the same time. That's horrifying. Um, so firmware bug and NVMe flash causing sporadic PC, IE bus resets, which recovered in fraction of a second but caused network loss because NIC buffer overflowed in that time. And it's like, there's a troubleshooting horror film buried in the statement. And I actually would like love to watch that movie because it would be really good. I, I'd watch a movie for any of these, honestly. 
um, then Dell C series servers, C6100s, um, IPMI board only survives attempts at updating it 50% of the time, and the process for reviving them was bad enough that Dell asked to send a tech out to do it manually, uh, because once it's failed, it's not addressable for a second try, even locally. So here's another Dell um, after that for a while came up with a bug in the fan firmware that made it think the server was overheating. Randomly reboot the whole chassis. Uh, the solution suggested was to increase the threshold for that sensor. It was great. Um, bug in BMC controller on IBM HS20 blades. So it's like both IBM and Dell, both bad. Uh, IBM support transferred my call to the chip manufacturer. They sent a new controller board and asked that I not tell IBM. <laughs> like, absolutely horrifying. And, and if, you, if you talk to people, like I've talked to so many people where like, Dell can't ship the same SKU twice. So like, the SKU of Dell that you get is like a made up SKU and then you open up the box and it's like a bajillion other SKUs. Um, and that just seems to be like a problem in and of itself. So outages in general are unavoidable and I'm only including this because some of these are really funny. Uh, data link between our uh, DR site and main site was having rhythmic packet loss. So like, ooh, X, ooh, I can't do it, right? <laughs> it was fiber and nothing could explain it except the lines had fallen from a pole accident and were lying across the road. Packet <laughs> loss was cars driving over it. Like, that is crazy. So I was like looking at this one, I was like, wow, that's crazy. It's like weight related. But this one is as well. So S390 box kept powering down, could not find a fault. Everything looked totally normal. Eventually sat next to the, to the box all night to babysit. it. Nothing happens. About 4 a.m. I get up to get coffee and the box powers down. It was a loose floor tile that was wobbling the power cable. Like, absolutely insane. Also, I'd be so pissed if that was me because I would be like, you've got to be fucking kidding me that I just, like, stood up all night. Um, so, yeah. Another kind of theory that I have for this, and it also relates to, like, talking to a lot of people about these issues, is uh, that it's kind of like a, a, a form of Conway's Law. So, um, in talking to, like, a few firmware, like, hackers, when they, like, find a vulnerability in like Dell's firmware or you know a vendor's firmware, they have to obviously tell that vendor. And in, in multiple accounts, like that vendor, one, doesn't know what to do with it right away. But then two, like they cannot talk the teams internally. So if, it, if it's in between two interfaces of like the Dell firmware and those two teams can't talk to each other, then the hacker has to do the like communication between the two teams, it's like, that is actually your problem, that these two teams don't talk to each other. Um, so, yeah, from the perspective of hardware engineers as well, like, uh, they tend to think, like, you'd be crazy to think hardware was ever intended to be used for isolating multiple users safely. So, like, the hardware engineers are kind of like one layer of the stack, right? And they're like, those software people are fucking nuts. Um, they're over here, like, trying to do, like, multi-tenant shit, and we're all like, please stop. Um, so, Spectre and Meltdown kind of prove this to be true, right? Because uh, if you ask like any hardware engineer or whatever about Spectre and Meltdown, they're like, no, those people were crazy to begin with. Um, so, that's super interesting. Um, then from the perspective of like that kind of lower software stack on top of hardware, um, they kind of want like the vendors, uh, the chip manufacturers and stuff, uh, to make their firmware do less. So like SMM, like, stop doing, you know, runtime services because it's just like fucked up anyways and it doesn't work well. Um, so they want them to like give them the, the control. So like these kind of communication channels aren't working out since no one seems to know the other side's opinion or they just don't give a shit. They're like, yeah, they keep saying that, but we don't care. So vendors can rarely debug firmware issues, uh, like I said, or like the hackers have to do the communication between the two teams and it's like this oversight and lack of communication leads to bad shit. So like, um, I don't know if you all recall, but there was this uh, hack on IBM's like bare metal cloud software where uh, the BMC 
of those servers was exposed. Um, and then the hackers were able to, you know, like distribute malware through the exposed BMC. So that, like, if you were to, like, get one of those bare metal nodes, uh, do this, and then delete your node, any other, like, kind of customers that come onto that node, like, the hackers basically own you. Um, and that's, like, the whole problem with the cloud is that, like, that's, that's a promise that they should be guaranteeing, is that, like, obviously the next customer that comes and uses these resources should not be able to, like, uh, have their data read or anything like that. So how did no one, like, when building um, out software, like, how did they not think about, you know, the BMC or, you know, like, protecting it or making sure it wasn't exposed or anything like that? Um, so, like, these kind of miscommunications happen when, like, the teams aren't allowed to talk or, or the team is just, like, so blinders on that they don't, they don't even think about, like, what else could happen. Or, or maybe they didn't know that, like, the BMC was even a vector, right? Um, because it's, like, our job is orchestration. It's, like, we don't care about that. Um, but it's, like, if no one cares, then no one's going to deal with it. Um, or if no one communicates that, th that they should know about that, no one's going to deal with it. And someone almost needs to, like, own that high-level vision, right? So it kind of goes up to them. But I've also, like, seen these miscommunications in layers of the stack happen in the container ecosystem as well. So, like, Kubernetes um, has uh, a couple, like, security features where it's more like a window dressing. And so um, this occurs, and I wrote, like, a blog post on it, when... Um, something is only blocked by the Kubernetes API. So, like, say, one example is execing into other containers. So, Kubernetes has a security feature that goes, like, you can't exec into other containers. But all this does is block the API endpoint for that. It's like, no, like, then you get, like, a 502 or whatever, 404, whatever the actual response is. I forget the one for not allowed. Um, so... If you were actually on the node itself, like, you can exec in through, like, multiple other forms. Um, and a lot of people use kubectl on the nodes themselves, and so you get into a situation where you're like, actually, I could just, like, combine all the file descriptors for the container and exec in myself because it's not that fucking hard. Um, even if you blocked, like, the docker exec, like, command, which it doesn't do. Uh, but, but if you blocked, try to block, like, all the layers, you could still combine all the file descriptors, right? Um, and so it's just kind of like one of those like things where I don't think people necessarily look at the full, book, full picture and it's also being advertised as something that's not. So it looks like this, basically, because you're like, I can just walk around this thing. Uh, it's like a common pattern. So most of these like vulnerabilities people find are actually just like, oh, I accidentally just walked around it. So the point kind of is like miscommunications at various layers of the stack lead to bugs in these intersecting layers. Like that's always where it seems bugs lie, uh, based off people having incorrect assumptions. So it leads back to kind of our like everything is poop, which it is, and everything has bugs. So how do we fix these things? Uh, well, we do it with open source firmware, kind of the point of this talk and why it's important. <laughs> um, Obviously, like, that doesn't fix all the layers of the stack, but I just think it's an interesting point. Um, so when the open source firmware movement started, it was first called NERF, um, and then that's non-extensible reduced firmware. Uh, they just ended up, like, getting rid of the name, but I still think it's cool because it's the same thing. Uh, it's still doing everything that this, like, entails. So uh, they're trying to make firmware less capable of doing harm, make its actions more visible, which is great, Remove all the runtime components. So, like, with the management engine, you can't remove all of it, but you can take away, like, the web server and the IP stack because who fucking needs those? Um, and then you remove the UEFI IP stack, and then you remove the ability to self-reflash uh, because that also seems super harmful. And then you let Linux instead manage all the flash updates. So, like, most people run Linux anyways, so it's like that kernel should already be vetted for you. Um, so going back, just to like remind you of this like visual, we have user space on top, the kernel, hypervisor, SMM, UEFI, and then the management engine. So you're kind of just like getting rid of those. Uh, you can't like entirely get rid of UEFI, but you can make it super minimal and just the management engine you can't entirely get rid of. 
either, but you can make it super, super minimal. So zooming in on these, uh, you have SMM disabled, UFI is minimalized, uh, and then you have your Linux kernel with a minimal user land. Uh, and since it's a Linux kernel, what's cool about this is like your user land is tools that you know, like you could use like fucking bash if you wanted to, like maybe don't, but you know. Uh, and then you have your minimized management engine. And so how you do the third part with the management engine is you use this tool on GitHub called ME Cleaner. And then the stack on top for like negative two looks something like this. So you boot and core boot you can use. Um, core boot, there's actually been a lot of kind of production usage that have, has recently made the press of, about people using it. So that's really cool um, in production. Super dope. Uh, and that's what handles silicon and your DRAM initialization. Then it passes off to Linux boot uh, to do like your device drivers, network stack, multi-user tasking. Um, and then you can use this project from Google if you want for your user space. Um, and it's entirely written in Go and it's a single binary and super nice. Uh, and then you have like all these kind of like nice user space tools. And since it's written in Go, you can like make patches very easily and stuff like that, and that handles your init RAMFS. So why Linux? Um, a single kernel works for several boards, like Linux has a shit ton of drivers. Um, it's already quite vetted, and it has a lot of eyes on it, and, used quite, and it's used like pretty extensively. Um, I mean, people have their like naysay about Linux, but it's like, that is probably some of the most highly looked at code. Um, so, it's a single open source kernel versus like the two and a half other shit shows that were like mostly closed off. Uh, and then uh, it improves your variety of booting um, because these like firmware drivers and stuff have actually already been hardened uh, versus, you know, the other shit shows. Um, and now since it's Linux, you can build in tools that you already know, like you can use Go, Python, whatever the hell language you want to use. Uh, and then when you need to write logic for anything that you would do at boot, um, it's, it's easily audible in like a modern stack, which is cool. Uh, it also allows you to like hire devs that are not necessarily firmware devs, like they, they just know other languages, which is also cool because the logic is like whatever. Um, and you get like memory safety wins if you use like an actual memory safe language. So it also turns out that it made boot time 20 times faster, which is amazing. Um, so that's also another great win. And now moving on to roots of trust, and these two things are tied together. So what you can actually do by having like all open source software is um, you can verify a boot that like the software that you're running is the software that should be running. Um, and like today, a lot of these open source firmware things that I went over, like Linux boot, it, it wraps like a proprietary binary, like a very, very, very minimal proprietary binary from like your, your chip manufacturer. Um, so you can do a root of trust that actually verifies like that the code you, you like have everywhere is the right hash. But when it comes to like a backdoor, if there's a backdoor in this proprietary binary, you don't actually know about it. Um, but it's still cool in terms of checking the integrity on boot. Um, so there's like a few examples in the wild of this today. Uh, Google has Titan, um, and that's like custom silicon that they wrote. They actually have given a lot of talks on it, which is great. Um, it would be cool if it, if it was open source, but there's like actually a lot of of documentation on this if you want to look further into it. But they have like on-chip verified boot, there's a crypto cryptographic identity and secure, um, and then boot firmware signature check and monitor, silicon physical security, and then transparent development. So that's really nice. There's, there's a really great paper on this too. Um, Amazon has Nitro, which is part of their whole Nitro stack, but then there's like a Nitro chip. And if I recall correctly, it's in FPGA, but I'm sure someone from Amazon will correct me. Um, and FPGAs, if you don't know, uh, it's like programmable, pre programmable logic arrays, um, which seems like it would fit pretty nicely for just verifying a 
caches, stuff like that. Um, Apple has T2, and if you're familiar with Apple, you're probably familiar that it's not easy to get information on this. Um, so there was a talk at Black Hat by some people from Duo that kind of tried to reverse engineer it, but then there is also this like paper online uh, that has some information, which is nice. Um, and I, I mean, it must have taken forever for someone at Apple to even release this, so thank you to whoever that was. Um, what it ends up looking like is uh, your boot ROM evaluates the iBoot signature, then iBoot evaluates the T2 kernel cache signature, then T2 evaluates the UEFI firmware signature, then it boots into UEFI, and that all happens on the T2 chip. And then over SPY, uh, UEFI firmware evaluates the boot.efi signature, and then the boot.efi uh, evaluates macOS kernel signature, uh, which is like, this is pretty clean. Um, and it's also like kind of easier to wrap your head around what's happening. Um, but it, it's more like just like a relay where one thing leads to another down the line. Um, so honestly, like if you were to read anything after this talk, this is like the best paper. Um, it also goes over the, the kind of security enclaves for your iPhone, which is like super, um, like really well thought out. Um, so yeah, there's that. Then Microsoft has Cerberus. Um, and so the specs for Cerberus are actually open source on GitHub and part of the Open Compute Project, um, but there's no code. Uh, but if you ask someone at Microsoft, like, if it's open source, they're like, oh, it's on GitHub, and you're like, no, that's just a spec. I've had that conversation numerous times. Um, actually brought up the repo to someone to be like, it's literally just a spec. Um, so no idea if they're gonna open source the rest of that. That would be cool. Um, but it goes over a spec for doing a root of trust. Um, so if you're interested in that, there's another option. Um, the catch is, though, eventually you will need to wrap a pr proprietary binary for your firmware. So it would be cool if like the vendors actually gave you all open source firmware, uh, because then you could actually verify without a doubt that even the stuff in the proprietary binary was not like backdoored or something when it comes to like, say you're like a, a government agency or whatever, you would definitely care about that. Maybe not everyone else would care about it obviously, but you know, some people do. So if all firmware was open source from manufacturers, you could actually guarantee the entire integrity of the hardware and firmware from backdoors as well. Uh, but, but today you can just basically guarantee that it's like what you say it is. Um, still this pi pipe dream uh, to have that though. Um, so to wrap up, um, through open source visibility, minimalism, and open communication, you can like push computing to a better, more secure place from the hardware up. Uh, we can't keep building on top of shit. Like someone needs to really care about like these base layers. And how can you help? Uh, push back on vendors to open source their firmware. Um, if, if the organization that you work in also buys a lot of stuff from them, like you're gonna have more le leverage than the rest of us. So yeah, anyone can honestly help in this space. And huge thanks to the firmware community and all their work on this because they've helped me like understand a lot of this like space because I knew nothing going into this. Um, so that would be like Ron Minnick, Trammell Hudson, who has great talks online if you want to dive deeper. Actually, all these people have great talks online. Chris, uh, Rick Alther, and uh, Zowlin. I don't know how to say that. And thank you for having me. <laughs>